I got an invitation to an underground group, or often you, newly hacking group named uh, Atlas. As a security researcher, part of my work is to publish reports, research reports on our blog, and to just tell the story of those people. The group actually found, found my report. And the leader of the group uh, just wrote in the, uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the Telegram channel that he just wrote, to whoever, to whoever reading this, uh, this report, I know you're here, uh, DM me, and I want to talk to you about something. All righty. Well, hey, hello. Thanks so much for tuning in, everyone. I'm super excited to be chatting with a new friend of mine. We haven't had a chance to catch up just yet, but please welcome. And you got to forgive me. I'm always going to get your name a little bit wrong here, but I think it's uh, Shmuel. Uh, cool. Exactly. Close. Was I close? Was I close? <laughs> close enough. Yeah. Right. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's pretty right. accurate. Yeah. Excellent. Well, hey, I know you were thinking, hey, if, if I get it wrong, I'll call you Samuel or whatever you're comfortable with. But would you mind just kind of filling in the gaps here, adding some background and context? Who are you, my friend? What are you up to? What are you doing these days? And uh, what nonsense can we get into? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, first of all, thanks again for having me here, John. It uh, means a lot to me. Um, so as you already said correctly, my name is Shmuel, and uh, I'm a security um, threat intelligence uh, researcher in a threat intelligence company named CyberIn. Uh, we provide a lot of um, intelligence services to our clients regarding whoever tries to uh, target them, whoever tries to harm them in the cybercrime industry and the ransomware industry. And um, I'm here today because of um, your very interesting uh, series that you made on the dark web uh, series. And you talked about the Babu family, you talked about uh, the ransomware industry in general. And uh, I was thinking that it might be cool to just uh, shed a little bit more light and just to have my input on uh, those topics, which I find very, very interesting, uh, especially this year. Sweet. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think um, for adding a little bit more background for the folks tuning in, um, you had reached out in an email, which I'm always happy to see. Hey, I love kind of seeing some interaction and engagement for folks just wanting to reach out. Um, and super duper cool. Hey, this is kind of off the tails of that cheesy dark web documentary. Um, because I figured, man, this is a little uncharted territories, at least what I tend to see on on YouTube, right on like, whatever, hey, public space out where you see things that are just normally for edu entertainment, normally for Oh, taking some time to relax and chill out. But there's a whole lot of education in there. There's a whole lot of value that comes from the awareness and just the transparency of seeing what is on that other side when you're going into quote unquote, the dark web, right? Um, yeah. And the cyber crime industries and ransomware gangs and the underground syndicates, etc. Uh, so thank you, thank you, thank you for wanting to come and shine some light on it. I know you picked up on the Babook ransomware. Um, I think in your email, you were letting me know like, hey, they are inactive at this point. Is that right? Uh yeah, in, in a way, yeah, because they, they kind of, uh, you don't hear as much about them as you used to be. They used to be like a really notorious gang and everyone, used to, no one feared them. But uh, over the past, uh, I don't know, I think year and a half, uh, there were a lot of new uh, comrades that came into the game and currently leading the game by far, to be honest. And uh, I was just thinking it would be cool to introduce the, the new faces well, not, some of them are not that new, but are newer than the book. And uh, it, it's not just we talked about the dark web in particular, but uh, those things have migrated um, to more communication channels and more community platforms uh, in the dark web. You can see them in Telegram, you can see them even in Twitter, which is a very interesting thing. But you can see them pretty much being freely and as open as cyber criminals shouldn't be. but I guess when no one is looking for you, then fine. Yeah, I think I've been trying to track some folks on Telegram. I've gotten myself a little bit of access in some of those shadier, squirrely corners. Because uh, Telegram, it seems like that's where the party is at now, mm -hmm. in my mind. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can I ask, and I don't know how much you're totally willing to share or if you have any super sweet show and tell, uh, but who is leading the pack right now? You know, hey, Lockbit got some limelight with their recent builder leak. Uh, I know Conti's still shaking things up here and there. Revil is another yeah. story. Uh, what are you thinking? What, what's the landscape yeah, look like so, to you? Yeah, so you, you, you pretty much mentioned the, the big two, right? You mentioned uh, Lockbit, you mentioned Conti. And uh, well, Conti is pretty much... Um, as for now, Conti have uh, disappeared pretty much. 
And um, it's not like to ever that to, to whoever uh, worried about county members' uh, financial um, financial state. It's not that they're, they're now going to be uh, legitimate software engineers or something something like that. So there was a lot of rumors, a lot of speculations, claim that uh, they have just founded their own groups. And we have seen a lot of groups introducing into the game in the past. Uh, let's say even the past quarter, we have seen over 80 new ransomware groups. Now, of course, then not all of them are going to be Lockbit and not all of them are going to be Conti or Blackbuster or whatever. And a lot of them are um, just trying to ransom um, individuals, not particularly uh, companies or big companies. But you only need that 5%, that 1% that will do the most damage because we have seen that, especially this quarter, we have seen that Lockbit is leading the pack by far. Like no one is even scratching the throne that they're that they are sitting on at the moment. Has that came from a whole lot of like ingenuity and thinking, oh, how we're going to build our software, our malware, our ransomware? Has that come from its affiliate program? Has that come from the <laughs> the bug bounty? What has led <laughs> to Lockbit's success, if I may? I, I will contribute it to, first of all, all of the above, yeah. but the main one was uh, the Russia-Ukraine conflict that in the beginning, once coincided with Russia, mm. um, back, I, I don't know if, you, if you, some of you guys do, doesn't know about that, so um, Conti sided with Russia at the beginning of the war, and it kind of drawn the attention of a lot of people that were emotionally involved in this conflict, and one security researcher uh, that at the moment we're not, uh, we currently don't, don't know exactly who he is or she is. Um, he, um, they have been able to compromise Conti's uh, servers and they leaked every piece of information, every byte of code ever written by the group in the past two years, including their financials, including uh, things like uh, money laundering they did, personal conversation that they had with each other. And uh, you could draw a really bright and clear picture about the group. So the group had no other, uh, pretty much had no other choice than to go on the ground. But once that happened, you can see how Lockbit had performed way more maturely and professionally, if you will, um, regarding this issue, regarding the conflict, once they had published their own announcement claiming, guys, we're here for the money. We don't care about any politics. We're just businessmen. And we have people all over the world who are not signing with anyone. And that was that for me. In my eyes, it that was the start of how Lockbit became the number one ruler of this industry. While while before that, it was kind of back to back with Conti, while Conti was the better one. But over that, ever since this point in time, you can see that Lockbit have invested a lot of uh, a lot of efforts in. First of all, as you said, PR. And um, a lot of um, enhancement to their products. They launched at Lockbit 3.0, the, the new nightmare, if you will. And um, they have tried to become not just a cyber criminal gang or cyber criminal family, whatever. They wanted to become some somewhat of a celebrity. And you can see they have their own follower. They have massive amounts of followers. They're actually supporting their cause, even though they're um, uh, criminals, right? And so at the end of the day, they kind of performed today as the king of all thieves or something like that. Once people admire them, people, um, they have launched this uh, PR stunt of whoever uh, tattoos uh, our logo get, get this, uh, get this $1,000 and um, tempting offer, must admit. Fair enough, they yeah. They do it, actually. But, <laughs> and um, so, yes, yeah, so you can see how they took themselves as an organization that wants to be known they don't just want to have, uh, I mean, of course, the income is the main uh, main uh, financial, the main gain for them, right? But at the end of the day, they want to be more than that, they want to be remembered even in a way, um, in the years to come or something like that, as uh, back in the days, Babook did, and Our Evil did, and uh, Dark Side even. Um, so those groups, you can see that you don't hear about them uh, as much these days. I mean, Dark Side have been, had their rebrands a lot during uh, the past year. Um, and they, they, I think that they're the only group that actually was claimed by the uh, government, by the US government, we're coming for you, we're looking for you after mm -hmm. the colonial pipeline. While Lockbit, you can see that they're pretty much, I wouldn't say safe zone, but they feel pretty comfortable where they are. 
whatever they, whatever, wherever they are, but they feel pretty much comfortable. Like we're going to do what we're going to do, and no one is going to stop us anyway. And you kind of see it happening, unfortunately. I'm glad you mentioned uh, Dark Side because that was one that I was trying to track way back when after Colonial Pipeline and some of those shenanigans. And then I think they had rebranded into Black Matter. Is that right? Or, or yeah. at least there was some speculation. I don't know if he confirmed or not, but then rebranded yeah, and no changed their form to, to Black Matter. Is that super duper common in your eyes? What are some of the telltales, if I may? Or what what light can you shine on how gangs might rebrand and transform into something else? <laughs> Yeah, so it's it's pretty interesting. Dark side, I think it's the most underrated in a way oh, yeah? when it comes to the intelligence. Yeah, because a lot of people said, yeah, they, they used to be there and that's it. But uh, dark side, first of all, they were pretty talented. You can't take that away from them, of course. And they rebranded it into Black Matter after the colonial pipeline because people were looking out for them. And they were pretty much, I guess they got spooked in a way or whatever. And uh, they decided to do the rebrand. And the rebrand, the proof that the rebrand of, uh, of Black, Black Matter was dark side was um, uh, code, uh, code overlaps between the samples and stuff like that that a lot of other security uh, researchers have uh, proved. And Black Matter also went off grid after a while. Yeah. But right now, even up until today, we have the Black Hat Alpha B uh, group which they did some underground interview somewhere and they said that part of us are the old black matter. So you can see that rebrands are pretty predictable because at the end of the day, the, the, the cybercrime industry and the ransomware industry in particular are very, very profitable. And once you're in this game and once you make this amount of money and once you're not that in the risk of being caught by the authorities, for some groups, um, it's pretty much like, why should I leave? You know, why should I go and go being a legitimate software engineer or a security researcher or stuff like that? When Conti made in two years around $3 billion in cryptocurrency, you can see unicorns doesn't make that much money. So, I mean, why? Why wouldn't I just, you know? It's We're in the stress. wrong gig, my friend. Yeah, it's we gonna turn. It's a wild. In a way, yeah. In a way, yeah. You can see um, we when the when the leak happened, um, we have a, we published a, a big report. We tried to understand how the group actually operated, how Conti actually operated, uh, and who was the key members. And you know, a lot of, we we want to, we were really curious to see. How a massive organization, how a massive group like Conti operated in their day-to-day work, and you see that they operated better than a lot of startup companies that, that you can see these days. Like they had, they had, uh, they had even an HR department. They had the team leaders. They had the reversers. They had, um, they had the social engineering section where they try to buy uh, products from security vendors so they can reverse engineer it and. Uh, do the invasion techniques they needed to do, right? So you can see how they operate as a real organization. The, the the stereotype of being a hacker and sitting in a basement and you know doing everything on the ground is not the same. It's not it's not what goes on these days. I wouldn't be surprised if they have their own offices, even you know. Oh yeah. Uh, again, in some places in the world, it really depends because I'm pretty sure that it, it will be hard to become a notorious. Mansour group if you're in the United States or somewhere in uh, Europe, right? But if you talk about Russia, Russia-based region, let's put it this way, it's fairly easier. And and to be honest, when we saw the conversations between people in the Conti uh, gang, we have seen actual people that claim that yeah, we 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 pass on information that we find to some entities in the government, and. We don't know what goes on. We don't know what they do with that. We don't know if it's any good or not. But the fact that no one is looking for us, that's good enough. You know? I think I had seen one story or one article or one news headline, and I don't know how valid this may or may not be. So I would love to get your take on it. But when there is a seizure, like when, hey, uh, government intervention, something is able to go retrieve the stolen funds that would have been hey, victim of ransomware etc uh, mm-hmm. after some yeah. incident um 
I had thought there was an inkling those get the, the money, the funds get poured into some unique specific vault for lack of a better term or like hey these are the things that will get distributed and disseminated back out into the market so that the economy the revenue the, the actual you know market recovers in some weird way i don't know uh have you heard this thing am i am i just talking out of thin air or is that something that seems like a likely thing or i think that's and i haven't heard about um like a known case where um uh, funds were returned even to some of the victims because in a way um, you don't hear about a lot of seizures of ransomware groups. Right. right. So even if you had uh, the seizure of our evil um, back in the beginning of the year um, by the Russian government in the cooperation with the United States and stuff, which which would seem like a really like wow, Russia is playing along with the United States. They're doing things together. They're trying to fight the ransomware pandemic and whatever. You see that um, um, to have her, to whoever that has been in this industry for a while, you, we all knew that our evil is pretty much dying year before. You know, once they caught the main affiliate, then the, the group was bleeding to death, and everyone knows that this is not a serious arrest. So people are not going to get their money back. Right. Um, but. It's, it's an interesting thing to see, but at the end of the day, up until the moment that no major ransomware group will be caught in its prime, and I don't suspect that anyone will get his, uh, his money back, unfortunately, of course. But another interesting point about it is that the whole, uh, the, the whole uh, ransomware industry has led to a new, um, let's let's say, a new business type to these days, a new service these days about the ransomware insurance that insurance companies mm. actually doing. So in a way, um, it's, it's kind of a funny thing to see because at some point, some, some victims might just choose to pay the ransom because they have the, the, the insurance. And, you know, the, the whole thing is, is, is a big snowball that actually leading and feeding the ransomware industry even more instead of slowing it down. Because now when people have insurance, as an organization, I'm sure you will agree with me, but as, a, as, a, as an organization, your goal is to make money and the business should operate. And if you're a victim of a ransom or an attack, a lot of the times it's not about the ransom fees, it's about the fact that your organization, your business can't operate properly. And you need to get things back on track as soon as possible. So the fact that they some, some, uh, some uh, companies have the, the insurance, they just said, okay, just take the money, take whatever you want, just get, let me get things back on track, especially if you're talking about uh, energy sector and manufacturing sector, stuff that are more time sensitive and should operate properly 24-7. It's wild. Yeah, it's, it's pretty wild. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, uh... I know you had mentioned, hey, there are a couple others, or there, there are some smaller gangs, the ones that aren't just the top dogs leading the pack. Um, but if I may, and I don't know how much you're willing, you're able to share, but like, how do you end up tracking those? Like, what, what is the sauce? Hey, what's the magic? What are the ingredients that keep you on your toes for a whole lot of the cyber threat intelligence? Are, are, are you rolling out, hey, things to scrape some of those onion sites? Are you just putting sensors here, there, or wherever? Uh, how is it done, if I may ask? <laughs> yeah, so, so pretty much uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of our work is to find these techniques, to find this, um, to open our eyes, to have a thousand eyes open all around the world and on every in every single community that we can find, every dark web, every underground, we do what we have to do, what we have to do in order to get as deep as we can. So a lot of a lot of times we have to use techniques like social engineering. Social engineering can work both ways, right? Oh, yeah. So um, we kind of have to do whatever we can in order to get as deep as possible to understand and to uh, know how the landscape and how the industry is performing daily, even even hourly, right? So our product, again, if we're talking about our product in particular, so our product is pretty much, um, we, have, uh, we have multiple sources, tons of sources that we are constantly feeding and constantly analyzing. And we try to build a story that revolves around threat actors and threat groups in particular, but also 
to try to navigate it to uh, to our clients. So if, for example, you're a big bank and one of your uh, one of your um, competitors, which is also a big bank, of course, that he got hit by ransomware and in special methods and stuff like that. So we try to understand those things in advance and we try to warn those people, warn our customers to say, listen, he was attacked like this and that and group, this and that. So you should prepare yourself because you might be the next uh, the next one that they will target because you fit the profile and stuff like that. So we have to know them from, from within. Like an interesting story is that uh, a couple of um, couple of uh, months back, I have um, I got an invitation to an underground group, often you newly hacking group named uh, Atlas, Ooh. and uh, the group was pretty interesting. Like the structure of the group was pretty interesting. They were they didn't do anything regarding ransomware, but they did more of uh, data leaks and uh, um, DDoS and stuff like that. So the group had. It, it, it really began to grow and they did some campaigns and they, they bragged about it in their own Telegram channel and stuff like that. And in their, in, in, in their more inner uh, inner channels and inner groups and more exclusive groups, let's put it this way, they have been talking about a lot, talking about it really freely. And of course, they will. It's their community, right? So as a security researcher, part of my work is to publish reports, research reports on our blog and to just tell the story of those people, just to... Let people know there's a new there's a new sheriff in town or there's a new member that, that is coming to hunt us all. <laughs> and um, so basically what happened is that the funny story here is that um, the group actually found, found my report. Oh. And the report actually did a lot of a lot of uh, track and it, it made a lot of noise. It's been around some media channels and magazines and stuff like that. And it, it, the group noticed it. And the leader of the group uh, just wrote in the uh, in the uh, in the in the Telegram channel that he just wrote to whoever to whoever reading this uh, this report. I know you're here. Uh, DM me, and I want to talk to you about something. So I was like, okay, this is go both ways. Either he's going to tell me like I'm coming for you, or or you know, it might be just I don't know, just a chat or whatever. Because a lot of the times we we have to interact with those people and we have to interact with those groups in order to try to understand them better. And these days, uh, they're they are they're still anonymous. They still try to to take care of their privacy and to um, to make themselves unnot unnoticeable in a way. But we are driven at the end of the day from ego, and we all want to be known and stuff like that. And a lot of them still wouldn't mind sharing things, or wouldn't mind answering some questions. You know? At the end of the day, our profession is to circle around and to be in the same form that they are, and to be part of the community that they are in. So, um, so of course, I reached out because curiosity, why not? Yeah. It was constantly going on with this. But, so uh, I reached out and I, was like, and I was like, hey, are you looking for me? What's up? And um, he just wants to say, like, um, good job, pretty much. Uh, Great article, <laughs> man. <laughs> good one. Thank you. Thank you for, for the publicity, for the free PR pretty right. much that you did for us. And uh, I'm just like, always glad to help you. <laughs> but, um, but no, I mean, of course, there's at the end of the day, there's still criminals, and, and we're, not, we're not trying to promote any one of them. But um, it kind of serves both ways. You know? The fact that you know about the threat means that it, this threat is faint. Yeah, that's a very weird balancing act. I, like, I, I feel like a tightrope that I even tend to walk because like, sure, I feel like I'm trying to spread education and raise awareness and like, look at all these weird, crazy onion sites and ransomware gangs and digging through what they showcase, et cetera. And there's some other fun stuff that I want to put together to, to bring out there. Um, but I know it is still free advertising for them just as well. Yeah, <laughs> like, exactly. uh, both good I mean, and I'm bad. Pretty sure, uh, I mean, I'm pretty sure that they, they, they pretty much look at your videos or any other security yeah. figure that is publishing something about it. I was like, my you know, YouTube or whatever. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> it's, kind of a funny, it's kind of a funny thing, but... At the end of the day, you know, they, they do it for the money, but it's always nice to be, you know, recognized as bad and dangerous or the big bad wolf or whatever. 
do you know uh the quantum builder yeah tooling to yeah. like oh create an lnk file or some like hidden masquerade shortcut so we were trying yeah. to do some research on it for my own work and uh i thought i'll just go ask like hey can i buy how can I purchase this product? How can I go ahead and, yeah. and can I buy the quantum builder so I can get a chance to play with it? And I forgot, and this will be part of the story that I want to tell is like, I forgot to like change my telegram name. So I'm like, okay, that's some pretty horrible OPSEC <laughs> right away, but I'm immediately coming together to ask, Hey, how can I buy quantum builder? The person responds like, Hey, we can do this sale here. I take Bitcoin. Um, nice username, by the way. And I'm like, Oh shit. <laughs> 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 now what's funny is that it, it, it was uh, just too good to be true, I guess. Yeah. To them. So they, they didn't suspect that it's actually you, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and oh, I can't wait to release a video on it because he goes back and forth because he realizes after I just let it die for a little bit, John, this person... Th th there's no way this could not be you. The timing's too convenient. You just post. John Hammond just posted a video on XSS, the hacker forum, you know, where I sell Quantum Builder. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, shoot. So now I have to engage. I probably should have changed my Telegram name. And he's like, if this is really you, if like, if you can genuinely prove this is you, you can have the builder for free and we can talk a little bit more about undercrime, underground cybercrime markets and like what this all looks like. And I'm like, okay i'm not gonna turn that down <laughs> exactly so i sent him a, a cheesy picture holding up a high quantum sticky note <laughs> <laughs> and he's like here it is here's the software like wow i'm apparently very welcome in in cyber crime markets <laughs> No, it's, it's funny because um, yeah, as researchers you have to walk this fine line between your curiosity to understand this world better because there are a lot of things as, as an intelligence company or an intelligence agency or whatever yeah um, you always you, you can't always know everything 100 percent you can always know everything 100 percent for sure but you try to go as deep as you can in order to you know raise the odds in a way so a lot of times you find yourself talking to these figures and try to sometimes they're very like like in your case like in quantum you, yeah sure come on it's you so <laughs> We know we're going to get things. It's that. so well, weird, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty funny how this, uh, how the whole uh, cybercrime industry is currently uh, pretty much became more mainstream than it used to be in a way, and kind of more openly. Even though the 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 campaigns become in a way more lethal and more um, bigger, causing more damage you know, to the victims eventually. Yeah. I'm assuming you spend a heck of a lot of time with uh, probably reporters or, hey, journalists or folks that want to learn and understand a little bit more about this when something hits the fan and the stories are coming out. Um, can I ask, how do you sort of explain this in, in layman's terms for folks that aren't up to speed on everything that we're kind of already versed in? What? How, how do you explain how commoditized or yeah accessible the cybercrime industry has come to grandma? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, to grandma, it's a little bit more complicated. But, yeah. <laughs> uh, at, at least when we talk, when we talk with uh, with reporters, and uh, I, I got to do it a little bit. So uh, when when you get when you get to talk to them, but first of all, a lot of them are pretty much aware and know about a lot of technicalities and think that. It's not that trivial for, for for people that are not from the industry to know about, right? right. But um, I, I got to talk to reporters from, let's say, from uh, Financial Times and CNBC and stuff like that. And they, they pretty much they pretty much know every, they know a lot of uh, they know a lot of technicalities. Of course, when I began to when I first started to do um, a little bit more PR and to talk uh, about uh, with reporters, I was going all technical. No, what's wrong with no? And stuff like that, <laughs> you know, it's when you, and so um, I try to, but you got to tone it down a little bit and try to uh, focus on the things that are uh, the more generic things. So the fact that an organization can't operate sometimes or, uh, or uh, due to a ransomware attack or the fact that um, what kind of assets will a ransomware group look into once they're in, stuff like that. So pretty much, the, I wouldn't say the usual, right? But I, I think it's it's sometimes you can make things very clear, even though you, you explain it so simple. Because the ransomware industry and the, the cybercrime industry in general, if you want 
it's pretty simple to understand, yeah. right? <laughs> but no, it, 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 if you don't get into too many, too much technicality, right? Mm -hmm. Um, it's pretty simple to understand, and everyone knows what phishing is these days, and everyone knows what uh, what ransomware is, and everyone knows what the ransom idea in general. It's not that ransomware groups have introduced it; it, it's, it happened during history. I don't know, but, yeah. but you know, I mean. So I would say that I think that the mainstream or the the, the people that are not from our uh, field, I think they're pretty. At least in the modern world, we can see that they're pretty educated about this issue because you see it in mainstream. You see it pretty much. You see it a lot, especially in the United States and in Europe, and even here in Israel. So you can see it pretty much. Uh, it's it's very popular here, also. So a lot of people kind of understand and know, and some of them even remember names of groups and stuff like that. So it's, it's kind of cool to see it. You know? Yeah, I'm glad there is. I don't know, just more awareness on it all. Mm -hmm. I think this is the key. Uh, I think this is the key method for us to protect ourselves these days: is the awareness about it, the awareness about social engineering, and about uh, how how uh, efficiently and how it is important to protect yourself. Whether if it's I don't know uh, version control and stuff like that, or if it's uh, uh, employee awareness and you know mixing um, uh, professional and personal use of the PC, you know, stuff like that. This is the basic stuff that a lot of a lot of the groups and a lot of the hackers are thrive on. You know, they're waiting for you to do this mess up. And um, so I think that as much as long as we have uh, as much educated people as possible in the risks, then I think we, we might get into a good balance of uh, the percentage of success of these things. Totally. Are you tracking mainly ransomware mostly these days, or are you kind of digging into, hey, what any other potential threats that might be out there? Uh, it, we could hey, chase whatever headlines between Uber or Lapsus or any of those shenanigans, or are you just, oh, seeing what crypto miners are of late or what new malware strain in RAT is accessible? Uh, where else are you kind of, I don't know, what what does your day-to-day -day look like? <laughs> So yeah, <laughs> so basically uh, we track every we try to track every type of uh, threat. Gotcha. So it also, um, of course, we, we we today we talk about the ransomware industry, but of course we're tracking uh, uh, information stealers and rants, and we always try to uh, find new ones and to have a deeper look and understand about how they work, uh, what type of uh, relations they have between each other and stuff like that. Uh, we, we also track hacking groups and um, vulnerabilities. We we have we have the obligation and we have the uh, we have to let's say for example if we talk about Uber case and, and lapsus and uh, so when this kind of event happens, you have to uh, our clients pretty much rely on us to alert them about it. You know? So we always have to be on point. We have, we always have to open our ears and eyes and understand about every type of threat that might happen or might uh, be affected to our clients when it comes, of course, to the cyber security world, right? Um, so this is we, this is our obligation to be, uh, this is our, our duty, sorry, to be, uh, to know about any new ransomware, any new infrastructure, any new rat that is being introduced. Who are the people around them? Where do they sell them? Um, how technical, how in the technical matter, how they operate, how they work, what they do within the OS, how they're being delivered. Like let's say, for example, if they're being delivered by uh, um, mail spam and targeting uh, manufacturing uh, uh, companies in the Middle East, for example, you know, stuff like that. So I need uh, our work and our job is to uh, make our clients aware about everything that might harm them from in, from within and from the outside. You know, so if let's say, for example, we found in a way in, in some forum or in, in some blog that some threat actor have been published um, credentials, leaked credentials from an employee of our, our uh, client, it's our duty to tell them as fast as possible because right. Uber is a great example for leaked credentials. And yep. it's going <laughs> way wrong, right? So Lapsus in general was a lot of other campaigns that I think even NVIDIA was at the end of the day, it was a lot of them was just leaked credentials. They bought leaked credentials and used them. Right? 
Now, there's a lot of things about, okay, so they can use multi-factor uh, multi, uh, multi authentication and stuff like that. Well, not, not everyone does that, apparently. Not everyone um, guards themselves properly because at the end of the day, like a business not always put this, even though we as professionals think this is the most important thing to do, right. not a lot of businesses uh, agrees with us, right? And this is pretty much what might lead to this situation. But overall, we, we, we try to understand everything and know every type of access brokers, whatever, you name it. Totally, yeah. Are you seeing lead credentials and just access, initial access brokers kind of be in the majority of current threats and stuff that actually breaks or phishing and social engineering? I feel like those might be neck and neck in a way. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. I, I would say that, although um, it's funny because everyone, even in the mainstream media, everyone talking about the ransomware industry and talking about the ABTs and espionage groups and a lot of this type of content, right? But the leaked credential industry is is a fairly successful one, and they have the key members. They have the key members that everyone knows. I'm sure that you are also familiar with Redline and Raccoon and oh, yeah. all these types of members. And you no, know, everyone knows that they're the bunkers. You know, everyone knows that everyone uses them. You know, it's it's the most they're they're actually doing past Tuesdays and stuff like that. So they they actually have. Uh, control over this industry, and they they're very, very successful. You can you can see millions and and hundreds of thousands of, of lead credential over every I don't know every day or so even sometimes. So it's it, it's an industry that is thriving at the moment. It makes pretty much a lot of money. I wouldn't say billions, right? But they're making a lot of money, and no one even no one even knows about it, right? No one even talks about it. So, so yeah, I, I would say that um, the fishing the, the, the fishing industry is uh, a lot of the times they can take each other. So a lot of the times the credential threat actors use phishing, so they use the phishing services in order to uh, get the credentials and then resell it in, uh, in other ground forums or web channels or whatever. But yeah, it's pretty much neck and neck. I would say. I mean, there's a lot of there's an option for everyone to be honest. So I got two more questions, if it's all right. Um, and then, Hey, if there's anything else you'd like to keep thinking about, but I know we are rambling for a little bit. Um, <laughs> can I ask kind of at a tactical level, like what are the spots that you're looking through? And I don't know again, how much you're totally willing to share, but like when I want to be exploring, I'm on xss.is. Uh, I know Telegram, where I can find some of those channels and some of those places, uh, exploit.in. I think that's pay to play. Uh, and I yeah. haven't gotten myself an in there yet. I think I know Genesis maybe Market should, is a big one. Send them <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll reach out. I'll have to go ask. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, those seem like hey, the the places to be. Is there more? What am I missing? What other resources? If again, if you are able to just kind of rattle them off, are there spots that I'm not tracking where I should be, or anyone else listening in, super interested, should go take yeah. a look. Well, I, I would I would say I would say it like this. Um, there there are a lot of layers when it comes to the community, the cyber community, and the threat actors and stuff like that. There are a lot of layers of uh, privacy and anonymity and stuff like that. So, oh yeah. So and it's pretty it's pretty ubiquitous. It's pretty, pretty obvious, I think. So, but everything and every new threat actor and every new malware uh, developer and every new ransomware group always have to go to the masses person to establish themselves sometimes even to recruit you know? so a lot of the initial leads that we find we can find in the more mainstream I say, now it's mainstream like XSS and stuff like that but our quality is not by looking just at these uh at the at the these forms but our quality is being in, is being uh, where we are already in some inner circles this way that we, we that allow us to predict and to allow us to see the shift happening from within yep. and not like a few steps before it reaches the the, the forums or reaches the um uh the, the twitter and telegram telegram it's, it's it's a bit of a mix because telegram is a lot of the inner circle right and even discord but now it's so yeah so everything pretty much starts 
And a lot of the things, let's put it this way, a lot of things starts in the forums, but there are way more inner circles than that. Okay. I'll take that yeah. with, the, with the grain of salt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. This is, this is, a, I'm trying to. No, I got you. <laughs> and I appreciate I it. Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> All right. So last one I'm thinking, if, and then whatever else you're willing to, to, to banter about. Have you ever seen and have you seen gangs or, or groups even abide by their own sort of uh, no-go zone or like their code of conduct, a sort of sportsmanship that says, hey, we don't target hospitals or we don't go mm-hmm. after schools? Um is yeah. is there a sort of I don't know people's court and again I'm I'm thinking back to XSS but like genuinely a sort of uh, accountability for fellow cyber criminals and threat actors. What are can you can you dance with that for a little bit? <laughs> um, well, to be honest, a lot of them say when they meet with a lot of the groups. Um, uh, I think I think you you also showed it. In, I think it was in. Babu forms, right. so, something like that. And we don't target any hospital. We don't target the, the healthcare industry. We don't target charities and stuff like that. And a lot of them actually don't do it. A lot of them don't even say they're not going to do it. Just don't do it. Right. Um, but a lot of them said that they wouldn't, and they did. So you, you got to take it with a pinch of salt. You got to, you got, you can't trust them too much. You, you, yeah, sure. You said you wouldn't target the healthcare, but it doesn't mean that. For me, as a professional, it's not enough to come right. to the hospital that is my client, for example, and said, don't worry about love, they're not going to do nothing. You can open the door, they will never come in. Fair no. enough. It's not about that. The ones that are not taking, um, they're not taking any, um, doesn't even have any uh, segregation or whatever or between healthcare and other sectors are the ones that are the hacktivist one. Mm. The hacktivist group, they're, they're just having their own agenda, their own purpose. Um, we can talk about anonymous, but it's mostly movement these days. It's not a particular group. We have seen groups such as the Ghost Sec, for example, and the Siege Sec, which they're former factions of Anonymous, and they have been able to, you know, sometimes if they decide to target, let's say, Iran, for example, they have now a a campaign targeting Iran, and, you know, if they will find anything that is valuable, they will probably target it, they will probably exploit it, you know? But we have seen some cases of proof that had some agenda, that had, uh, let's say, certain uh, character, special character, that we didn't see in other groups um, at this point of time. I'll, I'll give just a good, a good example of a group that had disappeared, but um, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, we're talking about a group named Against the West. They also named the Zed Buhonen. They came into uh, the mainstream when uh, the Russia-Ukraine conflict began. They decided that they, their agenda was, we're going to uh, attack and target every Russia entity that was possible, every group that is supporting Russia, and we're going to target China and so forth, and North North Korea, and pretty much every problematic uh, country in a way, right? And they have been able to expose some really valuable information. They were very, very professional back in the days. And the story was because they, pretty much the whole story around them was the fact that they did all those things. And I'm talking about, you know, publishing. Um, uh, cozy their hackers' identity. Yeah. You know, the, the, those are people that you don't want to mess with. Right? You don't want to... Me, personally, I don't want to mess with those type of people, right? And they did... Uh, they, they exposed a lot of information and they pretty much built everything around it and they built these campaigns in order to have like a solid, let's say, business card to show to governments that they wanted to be recruited by. Right? So, you know, but that's that's a group with a purpose. That's a group that wants to have something, has, wants to have some gain, some I don't know, professional gain, financial gain, whatever. But they, they had one purpose and they went it fully, they went full retard on it, right? So I think that it's pretty it's pretty it's pretty nice to see someone that has but like, that comes and tries to do one thing. Um, but as I already said, it's everything. It's always with a pinch of salt. Yeah, 
Well, By the way, they, they're the ones that uh, claim to uh, league, have a major league on TikTok. Um, oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Uh, they, they, they claim to, it's, it's kind of a funny story also. They reached out to me because I wrote about them a couple of uh, months back and they reached out and said, look, look what we found. <laughs> and they actually reached me on Twitter. It's not like they, it's not even Telegram and stuff like that. Wow. It was like DM on Twitter. As simple as that. And they're like, look, this is what we found. And um, th- we were going to publish everything on on, uh, on TikTok. And there was some speculation that it's not actually it. And it's something like it's, it was on, on the uh, on production. Uh, uh, production something. I don't know. I'm not sure. But a lot of security researchers couldn't confirm it. A lot of security, security researchers did confirm it. And TikTok has gave kind of two versions about it, about this incident. So first they said, we've never been hacked. And then they said, um, no, it was a testing in France. So it, it wasn't, it, it was kind of weird. This whole story was kind of weird. The group disappeared after that. I don't know why. The, the, the Twitter banned them for life or whatever. I'm not okay. really sure. Yeah. Um, so as you see, like the, the ransom, the, the, the threat, the cybersecurity industry and the cybercrime industry always provide us with stories to tell. Yeah, it is. It is fascinating and it's wild, um, but it's also so like interesting because I mean, hey, always in flux, super versatile, and there's sort of a weird reflection of ourselves in a strange, weird, twisted way. Like, yeah, an organization might have sales and marketing and HR and then operations, but you know, Hey, some other underground groups might very well have the same and moving and shaking and doing what they do uh, to keep money coming in. And, and I don't know, get their own press, get their own uh, stake yeah. and flag in the ground and say, Hey, that was us. You know, chest thumpy sort of, I don't know, righteous way. It's, it's, it's not just their own press. We're in our community. That's pretty much a lot of the times we pretty much doing them other tasks, such as QA, for example, or OPSEC, for example, because a lot of security researchers uh, analyzing their samples and analyzing things they do and, and mapping their network, oh. and then they get shit on Twitter, oh. and then you see it, and like, oh, man, I'm like, I need to change it because people see it, you know, stuff like that. I might change the encryption a little bit, and that, that's it. And I might change the... <laughs> it's a funny thing, but we actually kind of serve them in a way. I'm hoping I'm not. Uh, I'm hoping I'm not seeing any any problems to anyone. But I mean, you can be sure they're watching us just as much we're watching them. That's that's the truth, to be honest. Yeah, and that is such a fascinating thing. Like, man, we're 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 feeding the machine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, sweet. Well, this has been super duper cool. This has been very, very awesome and insightful. And I hope it's super useful for anyone uh, listening in. Uh, that's probably all the stuff, at least off the top of my head, that I wanted to, hey, pick your brain on. I don't know if there's anything else that you're thinking, but goodness, golly, I think this was awesome. And certainly a a, a strange thought to take away with. <laughs> <laughs> Well, hey, last one for you. I know, hey, you're trying to build your own community and get something else put together for the stuff that you're up to. And I do want to absolutely love and support that. Uh, where can folks find you? I'll have some links in the description, but uh, where can anyone keep hanging out and seeing what you're up to? So basically, I'm having just the Twitter account uh, right now and we're trying to build up uh, from there. So, uh, so yeah, thank you very much. Awesome. I'll have the uh, Twitter link in the description, but thank you, thank you, thank you. This has been super cool. And uh, I hope anyone listening in, super enjoyed.